thanks for joining us. And uh, we're, we're hosting a wonderful event tonight with Jamie Howard, who did Running the Coast. For people who, um, who were new to us, welcome. And for those of you who joined us on January 24th, welcome back. We're so glad you uh, joined us. Um, just a quick couple of thanks. Um, you guys on the, uh, on the WhatsApp group, thanks so much for helping along the way. We really appreciate it. Uh, Tom Kaczynski and Clay Andrews for your technical support. We, uh, you know, big thanks and a lot of gratitude for that. Um, oh, Joe Ballerini, Tell Magazine. Thank you very much for, for supporting us in, in this new endeavor. And Chris at saltwaterflies.com. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll be getting back to you uh, later on. And for everybody on Facebook, hello. Um, just so you know, Masters of the Fly is not really about being, quote, a master. It's really about community, love, the passion of the sport of fly fishing that we all share. It's just about being out there. It's about the process, the passion, and the outdoors. Um, and uh, it's something that we all share in common. Anyway, what I'd like to do now is uh, pass the baton over to my partner, Luyan Chow. And we'll get this going, Lou. Thanks, David. And thanks everyone for being here tonight. We're so glad we have such a great group. Uh, you know, David and I started uh, this, this crazy adventure um, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, last year in 2020 as a way to kind of uh, just get like-minded uh, flying blurs together to um, have some fun and talk about fly fishing. I'm really glad it's turned into as big a, a thing as it has. And thanks to all of you um, and everyone uh, that, that David thanked. I just want to thank a couple other people as well. Um, huge thanks to uh, Peter Jenkins and the Saltwater Edge folks. Uh, we'll be putting uh, links to, by the way, uh, all of the folks that David and I just mentioned in the chat and at the end. Uh, if you want uh, you know, a single source for great uh, fishing and fly fishing equipment, Saltwater Edge is your place. If you want access to uh, great saltwater fly tying material, um, uh, saltwater fly, uh, uh, salt, um, uh, saltwaterflies.com is, is your destination. Um, the next uh, session is going to be David Blinken actually doing a tying session for us uh, next Sunday. You don't want to miss that session in particular. And if you want the materials to be able to follow along with that session. That's going to be this coming Sunday at 8 p.m. Uh, go, go to uh, Chris Windrum's uh, saltwaterflies.com and there's a special, we'll, we'll give you the link, but there's a special uh, uh, part of his website where you can order all the materials to follow along with David. Uh, huge thanks also to the American Saltwater Guides Association. Uh, Tony Friedrich will be doing a session with us on April 11th. Um, they're an incredible organization and really important right now, given all of the, the, the um, issues and uh, legislative challenges around uh, saltwater uh, fish um, man management and conservation. And then finally, just a big thank you to Jamie Howard uh, and to Eric Schatzker for leading this session tonight. Uh, Eric is a very, very good friend and, and, a, and a really terrific fly fisherman but an even better uh, editor at large and journalist for Bloomberg News um, and has, has been a wonderful partner in our events here. And Jamie Howard, I mean, you know, I'll let him speak for himself and you'll hear more about him tonight, but uh, Jamie really to me kind of invented the modern fly fishing film and uh, has brought many, many hours of joy to me, I know, and to many of you. So hopefully you had a chance to watch a couple of clips that we sent you in the uh, emails and invites ahead of time, but we'll have a chance to talk about all that and more tonight. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Eric. Lou Yen, thanks very much. David, thank you. Um, folks, the first thing I wanted to say is, uh, given what's going on with the weather in this country, I hope you're all safe, warm, and have power. Um, I presume that you have power if you're joining us tonight. Uh, welcome back to those who are with us for the first session. This is the second installment of the Masters of the Fly series, and we are delighted to have Jamie Howard, uh, renowned fly fishing filmmaker, with us. Uh, Jamie, I, I don't really want to do too much of a preamble because I think so much about you and how you approach your craft is going to come out in our conversation. Um, 
So I'll start with this. Uh, it may seem, I suppose the answer may seem obvious to some people, but it isn't to me. Why make films about fly fishing? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to rewind a little bit for that one. Um, I was working in New York in advertising and I was a writer and a director. And as I mentioned to you guys before we went on, um, this, this thing called 9-11 happened. And that was a big life change for me and big decisions to be made. And I, that's, everyone has to take some risks in their life. And that, for me, this, this was that risk. And I, I always say, you gotta be fearless about at least one thing in your life can't be everything but if you're lucky if you got that one thing you're fearless about and for some reason this was it for me and so I that was this is uh taking my own money and my own risks and um I thought to myself this is I want to extend the commercials that I can only do for 30 seconds and I want to do this um in a longer format if I can tell a story in 30 seconds imagine what I the feeling I would get from telling it in a longer one and so then I thought Honestly, the, the, the magic that I felt from growing up fishing, maybe this is what I need to, this is what I want to do. The, that I, we weren't quite getting when we turned in on the weekends with our, with our beloved Bill Dance and Jimmy Houston. They were awesome guys, great personalities, but they were just doing something a little different. So I wanted that magic. And so I started this crazy idea of maybe we could somehow get it into the camera using some of the film principles that I'd learned and so off I went to the Bahamas to, to shoot a little short called in, um, Search of a Rising Tide. It took me like a year or two just to get that thing made and seen, just 20 minutes. That's amazing. Great place to start. I wanna remind everybody that we have a Q&A box. We're going to be doing some audience Q&A. Um, Jamie, I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, at least a couple of your films and a little more expansively about the art of filming fish and anglers, uh, but I would love to hear from the audience. We want this to be as interactive as possible. So folks, please um, start lining up your questions in, in the Q&A box. And uh, once we've gone through the slides, I'll get to them and Jamie can answer them. That'd so awesome, yeah. Jamie, tell me a little bit about yourself. You just mentioned you were in, you know, you're shooting commercials, you're in advertising. Um, were you, were you, I, you know, how old were you when you cast a fly rod for the first time? Well, you know, it was, I think like most people in the fishing world, you start out with conventional. I think I had a Zepco. Uh, yeah. Rod. I mean, those <laughs> so things were awesome. I. What a great invention, huh? And then I think my father, who was sort of the uh, inveterate outdoorsman, he sort of, he knew everybody and, and was never, never stopped, much to my mother's chagrin. Um, so if you wanted to catch up with him, you had to be out with him. And so I... I don't know what, I really don't know how young it was, pretty young, but the, the, it was, I remember it was a brook trout, it was the first fish I probably caught on, the, on it, and I was probably, you know, somewhere between maybe around nine, and um, I probably, and I decided I wanted to put it back, which my father was surprised, but pleased about, and I think that sort of started it off from there, just that connection with the natural world. Um, I've always said that the, it's almost like a divining rod. A fly rod is an amazing thing. If you can look at the environment that you're in. And then the secret that we all know that, that who fly fish is you, is you get to actually plug into that environment. It's just, it just takes you up to a whole nother level. And so it's, for me, it just, it took early, you know, but it wasn't until I went out West that it really, really became all encompassing. And where did you learn how to make films? Well, I think that was part of the, the, the commercials. You know, you, you had to make and tell an entire story in 30 seconds. The funny thing is, is that the budgets we had for those commercials were probably, I mean, I can't imagine what, how I probably all the films <laughs> I've done for those 30 seconds. M so, multiples of your filmmaking budget. Yeah, so, you know, that was, uh, you know, what do they call it, a dream and a prayer. Or, and so I was, that's how this was done. You know, lots of, lots of ways to, to try to apply those film principles that we'd learned where we had gaffers and, and lighting and, you know, and, and dollies and, you know, we're shooting on the streets of Manhattan with this, you know, all eight hours of the day. And suddenly I'm out there with just, you know, my little camera trying to figure out how the hell to get some of these. So that's sort of, that's where essentially where it, where it began. Are, are you responsible for any sort of Super Bowl commercial favorites or anything like that? 
Um, I had a, I had one commercial in the Super Bowl years ago, but I don't think the company's out of business now. So I don't know what that says about my commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Did I put them out of business? Probably. I hope not. But I think it was called a company called Packer Bell. Mm -hmm. um, computer company. So anyway, um, yeah, I, I sacked the franchise. So <laughs> <laughs> let's let's talk a bit about some of your films. You mentioned that the first film you made was in the Bahamas. How many have you made in total? Um, is it six? Six. Does anybody know? Is that, does anybody know? Um, and then we've done some smaller projects, like commercial projects. We did something for Maui Gym. We've done also other projects for, you know, um, you know, regionally for mm -hmm. um, specific groups. But I would say the main feature length things. I think it was about six. I'd have to somebody have to check me on that, but I think that's right. Well, what we have in front of us here is the title screen to the film that really puts you on the map. Uh, Chasing Silver, it's in the IGFA Hall of Fame. Um, tell us about this film. Well, I'll tell you what, I, that's an open-ended question and you're gonna have to steer me around, but I'll, say, I'll tell you essentially that when I, when I went in, just the way I went in with In Rising Tide, which I actually knew the guys when I did In Ri Search of a Rising Tide, which helped me. But when I went into Chasing Silver, you know, and I built a little bit of momentum with Rising Tide. Um, I was nobody. And honestly, it was, uh, I was basically going on word of mouth, calling people up. I can't even remember the degree of how good the internet was in terms of like having every network was on it, but I would find them, call them, ask them to participate. Then I would do word of mouth, call a guide, ask about a person, call them, ask about it. So Chasing Silver essentially was a kind of a, you know, three ring notebook, take notes thing for a while. And most of these projects tend to be done on paper and on in conversation um, long before they ever see um, getting in front of a camera. And so when I did go down there, um, I would say that I might've been blackballed by a couple of people who thought, who is this guy and, and what is he doing? Cause it's, he can get a little salty in Almorada. Somebody will tell you a couple, if there's anybody watching, <laughs> they'll, they'll tell you, you get a little salty down there. So they were not, they were wondering who the hell I was. So. Chasing Silver began as a kind of a, a, a larger project where I was going to shoot basically until I dropped. And then I was going to only take what I thought was the best of the best and then assemble that into what I see, what I felt was the right story. I mean, there's so many things that never seen the light of day. I and mean, we interviewed Dr. Um, Alt at University of Miami. He's a famous guy for tracking tarp. And we went up to Home Assassin, which is a movie I'd still like to make. And, uh, you know, Monty Burke just did a book about it. I got in deep with those guys. That's, that's total chaos up there. But what, what stuck and what stayed were just four episodes in a miniseries. That's it. That's all. It was only four episodes. That's the crazy thing about it is we all, you know, that's, it was only four. And I think that's all we ever put out. It's crazy. Now, you mentioned earlier that you started off fly fishing for brook trout, which is how a lot of people here in the East do it. Um, what got you interested in saltwater fly fishing? Because the first film you made was about bonefish and then this one was about tarpon. What well, was it, it that, that sort of uh, bit you about the salt? Well, it's twofold. And, and one of them is goes back to sort of my, my, I don't know what you want to call it, my, my um, mission, which is, I, I feel like the outdoors is so precious and there's already too many of us participating as it is. So I had this, this idea that if I shot in the salt, I wouldn't be burning a spot as badly because you've got to get on a boat, you got to find a guide, you got to go out into the ocean. So I thought to myself, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna really get people excited about something, let's make it so we can't just you know, send everybody over the hill uh, in this town. Now, of course that turned out not quite to be true because more people ended up going down to the Keys than we expected. Um, but, it, but I really thought it'd be a hell of a film subject. And, and I really thought, when I looked at it, I thought, who the hell can do whatever they want? Well, billionaires, and what do billionaires do? They get on planes and they fly around the world and this is what they do. So I thought, why not show everybody what it's like, you know, and let's, let's share this. And now you're looking at some clips here flying over. Yes, so let's talk about this. Isolated. And um, this is the, the, the aerials. And this is one of the things, you know, if you're a rock band and you do, and you, you get a hit and you do something a little different that gets catchy because you, you know, you do a riff that someone hasn't heard. Well, this was our riff and this was the aerial. 
And this hadn't been seen before. And there's a reason for that because there wasn't drones at that point. This and was, so, so take us back, this is what year? It's about, believe it or not, we're in the 2000s. I mean, this was 2002, three, something like that. And um, time really flies, right? Now, you know, now eight-year-olds are shooting this, but at the time there was no such thing. And so what we did is we, we asked um, a barefoot gentleman down by the marina um, who was a chain smoker and with a hell of a tan, would he mind taking his ultralight up and going out and showing us some tarpon? And, and he said, well, hell, why not? And so I put the camera guy on the back of this one. I didn't shoot this one. And I said, you know, see if you can go find some. And so you sort of see here that they went in fine and you're kind of moving in on them and all this kind of stuff. And when this went to TV, this was something people hadn't seen before. Now we're all kind of jaded. Now we expect it. We expect it to be kind of like, you know, ramrod, everything perfect, but in, this, in its day. So, you know, this kind of- no, nobody, So that. nobody had done aerials of, of inshore fish like that ever before. To our knowledge, the tarpon had not been shown on television like that because when we started getting, you know, what I guess the, the cards and letters, people were saying, hell yeah, hell yeah. And uh, they were psyched. And I think they were, they, they wanted to go get, you know, jump on the back of one of these things, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe somebody else had done it, but we, we were, to our knowledge, there just hadn't been done. And, you know, Walker's K had been doing a hell of a job shooting on film. They set a hell of a precedent. This was- The Walker's only, Key Chronicles? Well, yeah. And the only difference is ours was a little more Warren Miller. And theirs might be a little more sort of, um, um, I don't know what you want to call it, maybe slightly more um, old school in terms of um, the narration. So the, so, well, so both. explain for those who aren't skiers, you know, sort of explain how you adapt that Warren Miller, what you mean by the Warren Miller aesthetic. Well, the Warren, Warren Miller tried to keep, keep it a little bit raw, just a little bit, and then also have a commentator, have a voiceover that sort of is you. So it's like a little bit, let's have a little bit of perspective on what's happening. Let's not make it too dry or pedantic. Let's take them on a journey and try to have some fun. So no matter how awe-inspiring it is, if you can have a little fun at the same time with the, with the voiceover as your, as your raconteur, as they say, I think it makes the journey a little more fun. So it, as a writer, um, from the, as a back, my background, I really enjoyed writing the, um, the voiceover and the narration. I want to go back to the slide that we were showing just before we got into this, this one right here. So this gives us a sense of what's going on on the boat, but there's not a lot of square footage on one of those skiffs. No. Talk to us about the challenges that you encounter uh, making a film um, you know, in what are effectively pretty close quarters. Yeah, and just a quick aside, that guy shooting right there, his name is Todd Free, and he's uh, been on a number of shoots with me, and he's the voice, he actually does the voice, you know, friendships, marriages, even one's own sanity. He's the guy who did that voiceover. And the backstory on that is he was so hung over that we almost got in a, a, a dra drag out fight because I said, this is voiceover day. And he came in and Todd's a famous partier and he read it. And I was like, God damn it. That was the best voiceover you've done. I said, from now on, you've got to get drunk before we do voiceovers. <laughs> so anyway, Todd was semi sober again here shooting. I don't think I'm telling tales out of school. And that's Eric Wallace on the back of the boat. And, um, and here, you know, and I would either have a mic, I would either have a walkie talkie if I wasn't shooting, talking to Todd and trying to, we had a sort of a hierarchy of shots. You wanted the white, you had the wide, medium, tight. Sometimes I would be on that boat with them if I was shooting as well, which was a pain in the ass for the captain. Um, and, you know, cause it generally four is a little much, but mm -hmm. you know, it can get a little, it can, it can the boat, as they say, the old cliche, it can feel pretty small if you're not catching fish. <laughs> and it can feel pretty large if, if you are. So there's some times when there's a, some extreme awkward moments out on that on that skiff. But when you um, if you get the right angle, um, and it, there's there's some magic to be had. In that particular one, we were up in Maine, and we were we're doing our darndest to get stripers in the water. Every shoot has a goal. This goal was to see tarpon swimming. I mean, stripers swimming. And so that, you know, we try to set an agenda for each day, kind of our wish list, and then kind of, we don't make a big thing out of it. We just kind of lay back, but we know until we get there, that's what we're looking for. And so this, in this particular scene, 
he was trying to pull a striper in to the fly and we were trying to get it on camera. Now, there's a question I have uh, that I'd like to ask later about equipment, but you know, I, I, I work in television, so I'm familiar with the challenges of wielding a rig of that weight. Those cameras are not exactly light. You know, uh, what's it like to try and shoot these fish, you know, and, and get the right angles and maneuver in, in those kinds of uh, circumstances. Is it? Yeah. So Todd's, Todd's better at, you know, we, we would depend on, sometimes he would take the, 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 uh, the angler and sometimes I would take what I would call the, all the, the ingredients. So I would take all the, the close-ups, all the off boat shots, all the, you know, little details that tie the entire story. Maybe talk to Eric on the back of the boat there and he would try to keep that camera and to his credit, you know, he, that, that, that's, a, that's a weighty, big, weighty oh. camera. And uh, that, that red that he had there was, uh, I, you know, that's, that's why it's a team effort. I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to carry that all day. So I was glad that he, he was willing to step <laughs> in. We, we spent a fair amount of time training on land before we do it, before anyone works with me, we'll go and land and we'll, we'll just sit and land and say, here's the subject, here's the boat. And we would just practice for hours on land. Uh, before we'd ever get on the boat. Same thing with fly, with the fly casting. You know, it's not a bad place to start is on land. I, I can imagine. Um, let's, let's, let's move on to the slides about uh, running the coast because this gives us an opportunity to talk about uh, your best known film. Um, what inspired you to do this one? Well, I've been sitting on this one a long time. Um, I had been I first had pitched it to one of the networks that I've been working with. And as the la television landscape got more and more difficult, I could see that it was going to be harder and harder to, um, to, to sell it because I don't have the usual model, which is the sponsor model. So I have to either find, uh, generally, I'm going to underwrite it and hope to get my money back, which is, you know, always. You're putting up all the risk capital. Most of the time it's, Boy. I'm betting on myself um, with um, Location X and Andy's Return. Um, those were done by the network and they, they also put Chasing Silver on the air but uh, and found some sponsors. But I had essentially paid for most of the production for that, which is, yeah, that, that hurts even to think about. But yeah, that's, that's the risk I, I ran. And I just, because I, I never was any, never knew how to sort of build a sponsor vehicle because these were never going to be series that was the model you know like a 20 20 episode series so the, the the striper thing came about after years of looking at the subject and, and then realizing that this was i don't know it just it became suddenly so obvious and i can't tell you how long i think about these things years and years and years and then suddenly you just go of course you know because at one point i was like oh well they don't jump so why do i want to use why why would i you know why would i do that and that i'd ruled out a lot of fish and then just suddenly realized this is america's fish this is, this has to be done. And I didn't realize that the population decline that was going to happen in conjunction with the shoot, which what became a subplot of the whole thing. So why don't you tell us a bit about that? The timeline, when the idea first popped into your head, when you decided that you were going to go forward with production, how long it took to yeah. get shots like this one from Montauk, the Epic Blitz, and I guess, what was it, 2014? Yeah. Um, well, the, the progression, as I always used to say, I, you know, I figured I'd have it wrapped in a season, maybe a season and a half. <laughs> but I was so naive. And I think that the, what ended up happening is that the, you know, as I, I learned as I went, you know, there was a lot of assumptions that I made about, you know, where the great fishing was and, and all I had to do was go get it. And then, of course, as I went along the way, you know, the shore guys were, were saying, well, what are you guys just boat guys? And then the boat guys would be like, hey, you know, are you guys just fly guys? I was like, oh my God. So, and then, you know, and then we'd go along, we'd shoot more. And then we, Montauk, I thought, you know, I've got to get just the right angle and just the right shot of the blitz. And what I ended up doing is shooting it over three consecutive years until I had just the right angle. Three years uh, of the blitz. Yeah. I just kept coming back until we thought we had the blitz just right. Yeah. That's just mind boggling. And the yeah, film took, I presume, even longer from start to finish. Yeah. So ultimately from 
the day it started till when we finally delivered it, it ended up being five years. Um, That's just not, remarkable. Not, it's yeah, it's yeah, not something I, I, I I'm, 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 I'm this far from saying crazy, but we'll just leave it at remarkable. Yeah, I think crazy though is, is more accurate. I, but you, you know, if if we had, I'll tell you what, if it hadn't turned into anything, that would that would qualify as crazy. <laughs> Let's just be glad it ended up okay. But um, it it, it required uh, it required some some steely moments for sure. How many hours of footage did you have? You know, I, you you had asked me that the other day, and I thought, God, I really should figure this out. I should get I should have an answer for him. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you an answer for that. I mean, hundreds of hours. And, um, you know, the, it, what was the biggest challenge was I like to have everything transcribed. So I had to figure out a way to get everything transcribed. So I would have a, a basically a book to work from because I work from like kind of like a book so I can, you know, where's mm -hmm. and then you, once it gets digitized, I can start then I can type in keywords into it and sort of look up, you know, I can look up Blitz or, you know, Sunset or, you know, you name it or, you know, a quote, you know, but that takes. Did you have, did you have the narrative construct for the film mapped out in your head beforehand? You know, that the idea that it was going to be the migration all the way from the Chesapeake up to Maine? I, I did, but I didn't really know exactly how it was going to unfold and I you know there's the twists and turns of it that occurred you know you don't you don't realize that you know the Chesapeake you might have to come back or you're going to have to you know get rained out if you want to get the worm hatch you know so we'll come back you know an extra couple of weeks or you know we'll, we'll add it next year now that we've learned about it so the, the construct was there we knew we wanted to follow them but we didn't we we didn't know exactly that the subplot would occur of the of the declining population, and we tried to layer it in without without making it so preachy that it would take away from the entertainment. So that the idea was really to keep it entertaining, but to kind of quietly reinforce that let's try to hold on to these fish if at all possible. And whether it's for tarpon or bonefish or stripers in this case, how much research do you have to put into it ahead of time because even if you're a fanatical striper fisherman the likelihood that you know all the guides and all the locations and the timing at which to shoot going into it from the beginning is probably exceedingly low yeah so that goes back to the word of mouth model i mean you kind of spend a good amount of time um on the phone and on the internet and then you just kind of keep cross-referencing until these things just keep like a matrix just keep you know the same guy keeps coming up or you, you call him on the phone and he's he's able to talk to you in a way that you think oh i, I love this guy he'd be great or somebody says have you talked to so and so well, i haven't so let me give him a ring you know and and so it just sort of builds organically like that and so i i'm learning from the ground up i mean i had been to montauk as a kid um but i you know there's the key is to not come up short. So you've really got to just not take what you assume ever and, um, and sort of work, work from scratch. For instance, I didn't even know um, who um, the, the world record striper company, you know, with Greg Meyerson, I did not even know him. And then Paul Dixon mentioned him to me. He mm -hmm. said, oh, I've got a guy. He says he fishes right next to the guy and he catches all the fish. So, whoa, this guy sounds interesting. So then we, we, we went and found him. I mean, what a character, guys, you know, just, he's like the rain man of fishing. He's just off the wall, you know. How much of a factor is, is serendipity? Because I make the assumption that when you go out for a day of shooting, you're hoping, right, that you've got the best angler on the best day, mm -hmm. right? He's going to find the best fish of, you hope, his or her life in the best conditions. <laughs> that you could imagine. That almost never, I mean, we, we, we all have fished often enough to yeah. know that like, you can, you know, if you find it, you know, somebody's smiling on you because it, it, yeah. you can't plan it. No, no. I mean, I think honestly, like I make my deal with the universe, which is like, I won't, I don't fish on shoots, which meant I couldn't really striper fish for five, you know, four or five years. I might take one, <laughs> take one cast during a shoot. And that's, my, and so I say, okay, universe, I'm giving you this. And then I say, you know, then I just go into full mojo mode. I, we, we don't put pressure on people. We don't give them scripts. We don't give them, um, you know, an agenda. We just kind of start to, start to just disappear. And things start to happen a lot better that way. 
you know, if you don't kind of show up sort of assuming you know anything, I feel like the mojo really starts to rise. And, um, and that's kind of what we've done for everything. We spend so much time talking to people and then talking to people and talking to people. I mean, when, when I, Captain Chaste, you remember him? He was the firefighter in, in, um, in New York that we fish with at night. We had, um, I think we had Homeland Security pull us over a couple of times, <laughs> wondering what the hell we were doing. <laughs> True story. They had like the 50 cows on us. And he didn't want to go out that night. And I, and I said, you know, I just got a feeling we should. And I, and I think you, we've talked about it and it just feels right. And I think, and I think, you know, you're selling yourself short and you just kind of, you just kind of keep talking to people until you get kind of a vibe. I know that sounds just kind of useless information, but that's, that's the it best feels like I a good, it actually feels like a good segue into another slide that I want to bring up. This is uh, the bait and switch shot. And yeah. uh, for anybody who's watched the clips that, uh, you know, that you made available, um, and for those who haven't, you have to go and watch Running the Coast. In fact, you have to go and watch all of Jamie's films afterward. But uh, this doesn't quite capture Jamie, but it would be nicer if we could, if we could actually play out a clip, which sadly is, is difficult in this format. Um, tell us about this shot. Well, we had made the run over from, um, what was it, um, across to Cuddy Hunk. Um, from Woods Hole at about 4, 4.30 in the morning. And apparently you can hit the rock. So we were kind of thinking, let's do, let's hit this at the right tide. They, they recommend. Mm -hmm. And we got, the light started to come up and you know, you've got kind of a funny little window with stripers, you know, it's like the big ones, they, they'll, you kind of have to get them at the right light. Um, you can catch fish all day, but the biggest ones. So they were trying to play this game of bait and switch. And they, and as he said, he didn't want to wreck it because once you throw the top water stuff, you've really kind of changed the tenor of the fishery and that, that you're fishing into. And so we did, again, we did a rehearsal with the camera in the other direction, a little bit farther away from there. And we practiced it because I really wanted this one to be an all in one, we call it. I, I felt like to overcut the scene would take away the magic. So what we did is we practiced to figure out how we could get it all into camera follow the teaser, get it, and then snap back. So it wasn't like, you know, oh, let's get a couple camera angles and cut it up. And then it won't, it just, you won't, it'll just take away from the vibe. And so, you know, these guys, he said, this is my spot. We're going for it. And we had, um, you know, I think guides intuitively know when a camera crew is going to leave a spot alone for a couple of days. And I think uh, Dave Scope, because they're on the left, my left anyway, in the uh, overalls, Mm -hmm. um, cast a fly that he tied and then you got captain jamie boyle there and he he teased it and it was a funny scene because i remember he said i dave said i think i think it was not that a boil right behind it and the captain said no, no i don't think so <laughs> and then about i don't know a second or two later kabam and that striper just completely gave himself up and he did he actually did a little jump which was made it even cooler and um, I'll be damned if you just, as you guys saw, I mean, you can't ask for anything better than having a striper in perfect lighting, completely give himself up to a giant fly and then just go cascading across the water at your caddy hunk. I mean, oh, that was awesome. Picture perfect. Yeah. Now, did you map this out when you got there or did you have an idea when you say you rehearsed it? Did you, did you, did you know that this is the scene that you were exactly trying to create? Yeah. How much of that was made up as you went along and how much of it was premeditated? We, we had a, we were most of it was premeditated. I mean, we kind of tell the guide so they can kind of like visualize it, get their, get themselves in the game. So we said, you know, we'd really like a top water opportunity. We'd really like it to be for a large, <laughs> you know, no problem, right? And then what we did is then we rehearsed how we were going to shoot it. And then we just, we just went for it. And, you know. <laughs> I mean, we see, we see the shots that work. Yeah. Like how many shots don't work? Like how much of your time out there is just, is wasted? Yeah. I, you know? you know, this is the funny part about it. Like, I think um, we've had, because we spend so much time before we shoot, I think the agony sometimes happens beforehand. Now that, now that, but to say that, that doesn't mean that there is not pure agony. It might not be on this shot that you're looking at, <laughs> right. but there's, there's a ton of pain to go around. I mean, if you're on a, if you're on a flat skiff in the keys and it's hundred degrees and you haven't seen a tarpon in 
you know, an hour, everyone's, you know, Andy's chewing on his cigar and everyone's shooting the, the bull and we're, we're doing pretty well. But the truth of the matter is, is you feel it. I mean, you, you definitely feel it. And I think I, I wanted to show the agony of defeat in all of these. And I wanted to show misses and people falling off boats mm -hmm. and chasing silver. Cause that really was, cause that's the truth. I mean, that's what happens. It's, so that's it's part of the sport. Warts, sure. and all. Warts and all. We're going to show it. I mean, if, if chaos happens, some, you know, sometimes people apologize and say, sorry, sorry, sorry. I said, no, 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 no. You be you. That's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll we're going to include that. So we're, we'll might even include the stuff that, that that's a big clunker, but you know, that I would say that the, the tarpon, can leave you really feeling really small. They can really leave you feeling really small. <laughs> you know. Um, I just want to remind everybody, Jamie, that we have a Q&A panel. I encourage everybody. I know there's some chit chat going on in the chat room. Let's take the chat and move it into the Q&A so I can see your questions and throw them at Jamie. That Jamie, one awesome. of the things that um, uh, you know is is common and in, in, in we're moving into the slides that I wanted to bring up right now. One of the things that every filmmaker knows is that you can't actually make a film without characters. Right. Talk talk to us about th this this moment in running the coast tells a story about a character. Tell us about it. Right. So this is a uh, Peter Lorelli, and he is a um, a diehard fisherman that some people may be acquainted with. He shoots some of his own stuff and mm -hmm. he is a guy from Connecticut who gets up early and he has what a lot of guys have, which is just this undying passion. Probably most of the people on here have. And this was him out on a jetty. I think this was right before Hurricane Sandy. And um, he got into a hell of a bite that day. And um, I think he even, he even filmed this. I actually didn't film this. He got this footage himself. And um Peter is, uh, <laughs> he loves to find himself in the middle of stuff like this. And, and you, you saw him running the coast, he sort of recounted, you'll see that you saw the stripers tumbling in the waves. And that was just all on the front of that hurricane as the bait was getting forced in. You know, the bigger the, bigger the storm, the better for the shore guys. You know, they, they love that stuff. The fly guys, not as much because the boats, if they're out there trying to take advantage of it, but the, the good nor'easter just brings that a lot of times just bring that bait right in. And so, yeah, you want, if someone is, it, to be a good character, you all you gotta be is passionate. You don't have to be much more than that. I mean, you know, we went and shot the worm hatch. We got an average size striper, but, but um, you know, it was just a great, great moment in time, which is a real true character. And that's, that's, as you say, that's, that's integral to this. I mean, we don't, it's the fish are great, but there's more going on here. There's a story going on. You know, and I think that, that the, the right people share it. They're, they're the guys that you want to hear it from. You know, you want to hear it. You want to go on a journey with them. Well, that, it's a very interesting point that you make. And it actually um, reminds me of something I wanted to ask you about, which is where you see yourself in the, let's call it the industry of fly fishing movies. I see you as doing something different because a lot of what people see in the Fly Fishing Film Fest, for example, is really just fish porn uh, and a bunch of sort of fly fishing superheroes out to catch the biggest fish. And that's not what you're doing. I mean, I'm sure you'd love to see the biggest fish caught, but that's not the objective in the films that you're making. So t tell me how you see yourself as being not necessarily standing apart, but doing something different from what a lot of other people are out there doing with cameras and fish. Well, you know, it's, it's really hard to put into perspective because we started doing this a long time ago and people are, are quite good now. They've got, they're shooting great pictures and they're shooting great images. And it's, it's, it's been awesome to see. Um, I mean, when I, I can only put in perspective where I started with it. And that was essentially mm -hmm. to bring the magic of fishing to the screen, which I think a lot of people are doing now. And then I think the other layer is to spend enough time with it and, and there's, Audio is a big deal, believe it or not. If you want to give away a trade secret, you want, you want to get audio in there. And so um, audio can be a pain because um, to wire everybody up, but it, it's going to add layers to your story um, that go beyond just sort of the pictures and the music and then the narrator. And that, that's, that's one thing. And then I think we're also trying to, you know, there's a kind of, 
I don't know what you exactly want to call it, but you want to bring back something so authentic that the people nod their head that actually do it. They don't want to feel real, like, right? Yeah, they don't want to feel like they're looking at something that was made for um, a promo. They want to feel like, oh, I just actually, that's, yeah, that's what I just did yesterday. I mean, that was, you know, and so it's a, it's a real fine line between sort of the cinema and, and the reality of it. And so I guess that's the, that's what we're trying to get. That's what we're trying to capture if possible. Well, I would also point out that what you're doing, I mean, the keys are clearly a destination spot. Bahamas are a destination spot. Um, and I'll get to this guy in a minute, but you're not, <laughs> uh, you're not doing what effectively amounts to promo films for, and if, I mean, when I say effectively, but sometimes they can feel like promo films for exotic destinations. That's yeah. also not the kind of filmmaking you're doing. No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to go and catch a GT and, um, although I'd love watching that footage, but, but in the I, Seychelles, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the exotic fish thing has been, that is almost like a genre of itself. You know, I didn't, that's, you know, they've, there's no rock that hasn't been, you know, turned over in that genre. And that's been fun to, to vicariously go on the journeys, but yeah, this is a, this is a little different. This is, I mean, as you tell us what's out, happening in this image here, a Andy here, um, and that's Nikki. And they've now got a podcast. Um, Andy is, is, is a, um, as you know, crazy. And that's, that's why we love him. And um, his, I think his wife, Chris Everett was just on the other side of the shot during, during this. And I think you can, she probably is rolling her eyes, but this was more information than you want to know, but you asked me what's going on here. So that's Nikki. This was mother's day and he was outside. He's going to kill me if he's, 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 I don't know what he's doing right now, but he was crying because he's his something he something had gone on with his card for Mother's Day. Now Andy, of course, oblivious to it all, is working on his bucket, <laughs> his bucket demo, <laughs> trying to make sure he gets the exact <clears throat> twelve pounds of pressure on his bucket. And I remember fit, when I was fishing with Andy recently, you see, he's he, just t testing the strength of the tippet. He was, and he ran. He's got a little pulley system. And as he says, the fish is going to weigh like maybe 8% of its body weight in the water. When it jumps, you're going to get that full weight. But it's in the water, mm -hmm. you can actually mess with it because suddenly it's, it's buoyant. And if you put, it might, if it's at 8, 10% and you put that much pressure on, you're actually going to mess with them. And that's what most people feel like they're bending the tip and they feel like they're doing something to the tarp and they're doing nothing. So what he's showing is if you can get that pull into where his hands are, clamp on the line and actually you'll feel it. You, if you get a bucket, you'll see, like, if you go like this, the bucket won't move. If you suddenly tilt down and ease the rod back, the bucket goes right up. And he, and he knows now, I mean, the old timers know like Stu App and those guys, they, they could do it without a bucket demo because they did, they broke off a hundred fish. They know where 12 pounds of pressure feels like, but for him, this is how he did it right in his backyard. And it, uh, it paid a lot of dividends for him. ingenuity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is key. So, uh, a good question here. Outside the realm of advertising, uh, what sense of storytelling or cinematics have uh, influenced your work? I would say that, um, you know, most of the films that I have, lo I love documentaries, you know, in fact, I loved, you know, um, believe it or not, if you saw the making of the apocalypse now, what was that movie? What was that called? Um, um, Heart of Darkness, I believe, was, that was a mm -hmm. that was a hell of a movie, and I I sort of always been a sucker for that kind of thing where you're you're seeing something but it's a little bit raw, and um, you know I love I love the you know like the in the podcast world, believe it or not, it's not film, but I love the In the Dark series they just did. I don't know if you guys followed that one, season two with Curtis Flowers, but just going and finding a story. And, and uncovering it. And some people do it really well. And some people, um, you know, have their own approach, but I've, I've always loved, um, I've always loved documentaries. And, um, you know, that's, that's always been a big influence on me. And when I first, when I was first in the ad world, it was the, uh, it was these big time, you know, like uh, directors, you know, like Michael Bay, <laughs> you know, I was like, I want this guy to shoot my commercial. You know, and then he went off and shoot all these, shot all these blockbusters, you know, like Midway and stuff. This, this, that was never going to be what I was going to be shooting. But um, I did love that, 
the, the way they could control the cinema. And so we would steal some of that stuff. We just do on a lower budget. We'd find ways to get the dolly moves and we'd, we'd get a boat to slide by another boat. And then we, that's how we'd get our track. We call it a tracking shot. You know? And so we'd bring all that stuff in. in More our ingenuity. Own way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's another good question from the audience. Please speak to that moment of chaos when you finally hook up on a fly rod with a striper or a tarpon and you know landing it may not happen. And this is something that's got to vex the filmmaker for sure. Yeah, so I'll be honest. When you, that, that feeling you get when, you, when, the, lot, when the line goes tight, you, it's, it's just so good. You're not even thinking about the, the loss. You just, there's, there's nothing better than when a plan comes together. I remember in, um, and this, you'd have to know this, the movies at this point, but if you've seen Chasing Silver, um, when, when Fitz Coker goes tight, and I, I had an angle that I wanted to shoot because if I can have a boat in the foreground and a tarpon in the background, it would create a, a sense of the size of the tarpon, but I needed foreground. And so when it, when it was caught and it jumped, I think you, had, you could hear me in the background. We had, to, we had to get me out of the shot, you know, my voice. But those moments are just, you work so hard. It's so hot. You spend so much money, you spend so much time. The moment the line goes tight, um, there's just really nothing like it. You're not even thinking about the loss. Now, the, the loss does come. And um, when, when it does, you, you, you're okay with it. Um, I'm actually okay with it. It's because you're, you're not gonna get every tarpon. And, and, and I've been, had really good fortune to fish with some really good anglers. And Andy's really good at, at getting tarpon in. And so, when he loses one, I'm like, that's part of the story, man. I'm, I'm all in, I'm, I'm okay with that. But um, in location X, when we had that 150, 160, 170, whatever the hell that thing was, take off. And I remember the immortal quote from the guy that said, let it run, he yelled. I'm like, <laughs> it's just, there's, just a, <laughs> there's an irrationality to all of this. Like, what the hell else are you gonna do? But let it run. Like there was a choice in the matter, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's just, no one's thinking clearly at that point. It's all irrational, you know? And that's what I love about this. We're trying to, we're trying to take something completely irrational. That's why I think why tarpon fishing just captures people's imagination. I mean, it's, it's stupid. I mean, you're, you're going after something, it's a couple hundred pounds with a little thing and the, fly, and the flies get smaller every year till you're down to like brown trout size flies. And then, it, and then it, when it goes tight um, and the thing erupts, you just uh, you think to yourself, God damn, this is, um, this is worth the trip. And so that's why you have the right people on the bow because believe me, we shot um, the sequel to Chasing Star. It's a long story, which I'll condense way down. But um, there, was, there was bad weather, it was late, we were out of time, the network wanted it. And we had, we got up with John O'Hearn and Andy and went and got them. And believe me, the, the fish that you see on there is beautiful footage, but the fish you see on there, were, that was it. I mean, that's all the fish wow. we had. We got them on camera. That's it. That's all you got there. lucky. Yeah, very lucky. Do you have a favorite fish? Do you have a, and do you have a favorite Actually, place to Andy fish yourself? Andy had to stay an extra day on that one. He was, he was he wanted to go home. We said, you can't go home. We, we don't have enough fish yet. <laughs> you can't go home yet. <laughs> so that was that was a problem. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I was just wondering if you have, do you have a favorite fish? And do you have a favorite place to fish? I will, I will not tell you my favorite place to fish, but I will tell you my favorite fish. It's a brown mm -hmm. trout. It's a, it's, it's Isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm not gonna tell you what I fish. <laughs> And, and, and the rationale that you had way back when, 20 years ago, not to shoot freshwater locations still applies that it's, um, yes, yeah. the, the threat of the pressure that it's gonna put on the fishery is just too much to bear. Absolutely. I mean, I think we're all here because we just love the hell out of fishing and fly fishing. And, you know, there's a right day for conventional fishing. I'm sure we all conventional fish sometimes. I mean, there's no, there's no snootiness here. Um, fly fishing, you know, and running, running the coast, we mixed, we mixed the media, so to speak. Yep. And when we got to a, a place that was shallow and we could look into the water, get your fly rod out, man. When you're, when you're on the rocks and it's in the middle of the night, get your conventional gear out and let's see what the hell we're going to find. And you remember Greg Myerson was like passing out. He'd, he'd been fishing for like six hours and he's like talking to himself. <laughs> you know, we're like, just keep rolling. You know, you got, this is what we're going to use for this. So I think there's always a, you know, the right fish in the right moment, but you know, there's a, the pain we'll share as well. 
and I hope it's all right. I mean, I believe me, I love tarpon. I mean, I love them. I love permit. I love bonefish. I mean, I, I love all fish. I love carp. I love the hell out of carp, especially on the fly. Common carp. I, I po poached one out of Trump's. Um, I've had some orange juice, so I'm talking a little freely here, but I, I, I poached them <laughs> out of Trump's pond a couple years ago with another angler who'll be anonymous. I mean, that was fun. That was super fun. And so I, I you know, there's no end. I, and if I did do a freshwater film, I think smallmouth would mm -hmm. be pretty cool. I'm, I'm kind of been sort of talking about doing something with that for a while because we've kind of got something similar here in Virginia where the tarpon, I mean, the, the smallmouth population is declining. But I think a big smallmouth is one of the coolest things you can ever do. I mean, I think the 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 skill required to catch actually to catch any big bass it should never never overlook a bass um, so there may be a smallmouth film in the offing you talked about wanting to go and do something in homosassa bay what a you know given an unlimited budget and the resources <laughs> to you know to pursue your dreams what else what other films do you want to make yeah I, the homosassa thing would be good it's a little intimidating i think the smallmouth thing would be great i think you know the tarpon thing if we could do it our own way i think andy and i would, might do one more we could figure out a way to do it um sort of you know he's he's done it every which way but we, we were talking about one other one with with that as well and then of course there's always the idea i don't have to do something around fishing <laughs> but the world is it they say they keep pulling me back in right i don't think the world wants me to shoot anything but fish so i've decided i'm going along with that plan so and i'll take suggestions too but um you know i think honestly after um running the coast because of this crazy business model I have. And I do keep a day job in the ad world still. Um, and that was, I was working two jobs for five years. As you can tell, I haven't shot anything <laughs> since then, <laughs> except for small projects. So I've, I've, you know, I give it all I got and then I, you know, pass out for a few years. It's sort of like a cicada. So I'm, I'm hoping you guys will get me to come back out, get me out. We got to figure out. Well, maybe, maybe we'll start a GoFundMe or something. <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, there's a good question here, Jamie, uh, you know, in the context of not revealing freshwater fishing spots, to what degree, if any, do you get pushback, blowback uh, about the, the the spots that you choose to shoot in the salt? Because you know, any good fishing spot is a close is a you know it may not be a secret, but it's closely guarded. Well, I mean, if we go in order. Um... In search of rising tide, I think we were we were okay. I mean, you were going to be hard pressed to follow in our footsteps in those in those myriad of islands down there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, in chasing silver, we ran into it's funny we ran into one moment in the, at the pocket, and I remember someone circling around us, just going crazy. I think we were in the hallowed pocket because we were we had parked just wrong. In the old days, there were like these slots that people would fish in. And, and I remember people saying, you know, what the hell are you doing here? Get out of here. And it turned out that the guy on the boat was, was um, someone who will remain nameless, who they would have been very embarrassed if they knew who they were yelling at. They just assumed they were yelling at me. But um, yeah, we, we, we've, we've definitely gotten that for sure. Um, but, but for the most part, I I've, haven't found that the specific spots, I mean, there, you'll definitely, there's some, definitely some uh, landmarks, but then, but then you got to catch the fish, you know? Yes. It's like, even if you go find it, you know, you got it, there's tide, there's, there's, you know, there's time of day, you know, there's, there's wind. And then of course the ability to catch the fish. So I felt like we're still kind of, the fish are still kind of keeping up their end. We didn't shoot in like the canal, for instance, right? Where it's just, you know, it's a famous sort of shooting gallery for stripers, which people love, but just that wasn't going to be necessarily what, something for us to do. We, uh, we talked briefly earlier about uh, how equipment has evolved over the past 20 years, and it is truly incredible. I mean, those of us, you know, anybody can right, whip out an iPhone and shoot pretty good looking footage of, uh, of a fishing moment. Um, how is that changing the game? How is that changing the way that you think about filmmaking? Um, is it democratizing filmmaking the way that I think it is? Um, and does that force you to raise your game as a result of the fact that so many people, as you point out, you know, a 15 year old kid with the Mavic can go out and shoot some pretty incredible overhead footage yeah. just about anywhere. Yeah. I, no, I don't, I don't see it as a problem. I, I don't, I really don't. I think you, you still have to make the film. I mean, you can make, you can 
everyone can get a pretty picture, but you still got to, there's a lot of work going in. If you want to turn the whole thing into a soup to nuts film, you've got to smooth out all the sound. You got to smooth out all the color, smooth out all the edits. And, you know, to be honest, I, I used an, I, I used a couple of iPhone shots in the uh, running the coast. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, uh, there were some scenes um, where I thought, Oh crap, what are, are iPhone? Get, get an iPhone, you know? And I thought, I love that. The fact that we just, you know, you're never dead. You're never dead. You know, there's always, there's always a way to digitize, get the, get it out. So that's, I, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. And do you, you know, as, as somebody who dreamed about making films for himself, um, what would your advice be to anybody who might be watching right at this moment or who might pick this up at some point in the future, who has, uh, you know, who shares that same dream and who maybe wants to turn it in, turn, you know, turn, turn the dream into reality. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I've been amazed by the number of people who have done it. And I remember when the guys who did uh, running down the man first, came, we, we intersected and he says, Oh, I'm thinking about doing something, you know, and I was really busy at the time and I really didn't even know what he was talking about. And then I saw, it, I was like, Oh my God, there's so many people doing so much. I think if, if you're talking about a barrier to entry, I would say the number one thing is to is to just put something together of modest length, maybe a really nice 90 seconds, then a really nice three minutes. And then and then you have to ask people, is this any good? And you have to ask people that that you respect. And um, and then from there, you know, the internet is so, as you say, so democratized, you post it and the world will tell you whether it's, it's worth watching. And it's cool, man. There's so much stuff out there. Um, but I would just say, do that, just do that, you know, just focus on, focus on getting that right and, and getting it to a point where it's, and then you'll learn all the little things that require to make it a good three minutes, you know? Is there a scene uh, from any of your filmmaking escapades that's just burned into your memory, the kind of thing that you see and replay in your head when you close your eyes? Um, well, to me, it's it's more about the, the backstory on it. So, mm. you know, when I when I think about, you know, Andy Smith walking across the flats and in, in search of a rising tide and, and, you know, just kind of sitting there by myself and and him catching that huge fish at the end and just remembering how good that felt. I felt like, you know, you, you try to visualize these shots in your head and when they come together, it's just, it's, it's an unbelievable feeling because there's so much pressure um, until that line goes tight. I think those are the moments that, that I'll remember. And I remember every, every, I'll remember, I can remember every single frame. And this is, this is funny. Every single frame of every movie probably has a story. So we could probably spend the next 24 hours talking, but there's probably a long backstory about every single shot, how it, how it took to get there. And so that there's a lot of, a lot of pain. So every time it's, it's just, there's a lot of satisfaction that, that goes into getting it for sure. You know, that, that first aerial was super exciting. Um, the, the first tarpon that went in the air, um, I'll bet. Unbelievable. And I, you know, in Location X, we didn't even know what the hell we were getting ourselves into. And we happened to be able to find those fish during the right weather and the right conditions. I don't know if you can go back and shoot that now, you know, for a number of reasons. But, but um, we were just, wow, you know, we kept pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope. Let's see if we can get them in six feet, five feet, four feet, two feet. Okay, let's wade for them. Okay, now let's try top water for them. I mean, it was just bananas. So yeah, you'll, you'll ne you never forget experiences like that when you're pushing the envelope and it, and it, and it actually works out. You're just like, no way. You know? um, I, I want to hand this back to, uh, to, to David and to Luyan in just a second, uh, because we have, we've been going at this for an hour, believe it or not. Uh, but a couple of quick questions for you, Jamie, before I do that. Um, one is, uh, are there any fly fishing filmmakers that have come along since you started, um, whom you've become a fan of and who well, you learn from and, and, and are inspired by. Well, I, you know, the, the felt soul guys have always done a great job. And I, again, I first saw them when they did, when they did running down the man and then the guys over at catch magazine, is that what it is? Todd Moen. He's doing great stuff as well with uh, Brian O'Keefe. Um, they're doing super stuff. Um, 
And then as far from the TV angle, I just want to give a shout out to Walker's K Chronicles. Always good to go back and look at those old episodes because Flip can, man, that guy can tell a tale, never gets old. And so I, you know, Very true. I'm looking forward. I'm also looking back, you know, and, um, you know, I had the privilege of meeting Lefty and he had, the, he had the fine art of making everybody feel like they were his best friend. And he did the, he cast the same spell, <laughs> spell over me. And, you know, he just, those guys were sort of the early days of all of this and they were doing it in their own way. And, um, you know, it's sort of, it was sort of fun to go back and look at sort of all that stuff. And it seems sort of, you know, and you think, look at where it is now and it's, it's kind of hip almost, you know, with the way they dress and the hats and stuff. And those, there's nothing hip about what those guys are doing, but there's so much pride. And when you look at the, in running the coast and you see Bob, Popovic's attic. I don't know if you saw that scene. That sort of that old, um, all those guys coming. This is pre-internet. Those guys managed to gather all in one place without the internet. They all found it and they would all crowd on the street and fly cast and his wife would make dinner and Lefty would show up and tell stories. And just that little footage of that was just, was just gold. We dug that up in Bob's attic. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll throw Bob Popovics in that, in that group too. Guys, I love footage. I love, and, and of course, Peter, you know, Peter was in, in the movie with us and he's, he's done a good job of documenting his travels as well. Peter Lorelli. Mm. Fantastic stuff. Uh, Jamie, it's been wonderful talking to you. We may yet have a few more questions from Lou Yen and David. So I'll hand the baton back to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, both of you. Uh, what an incredible uh, evening and uh, what an incredible story, Jamie. We should make a movie about the making of the movies uh, that you've right. films has put together. I mean, just the, the stories behind every single one of these shots uh, in every one of these iconic movies. And thank you so much. I know we could keep doing this for many hours, but uh, it's, uh, it's late on a Monday uh, school night. Um, so... I think we are going to wrap it up here officially and then, uh, you know, we'll hang out for maybe five more minutes or 10 more minutes if anyone's interested. Dave, Dave Peros had a question about had I seen the mil, uh, movie Tarpon? Yeah, go ahead. And I, and I have. Um, at the time, it, it had not played much of a role um, in the way I approached Chasing Silver, but I had seen it. It took me a while to track it down. Um, because we were kind of doing something different, but it, 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 there were shades of it in there for sure. That sort of that that sort of rawness. He he his documentary. He spent um, he was more sort of gathered around with the cast of characters day in and day out, sort of drinking and smoking, and it became really about that old sort of Key West vibe. But I, I love I love that uh, love that old project. Yeah, it's great. Um, you know. The storytelling brings up memories from when I was a kid and I would turn into uh, turn on to ABC Sports and see the American Sportsman with Kirk Gowdy and watching, you know, watching uh, Lee Wolf tying a size 18 fly in his fingertips. Anyway, I know I'm dating myself, but, uh, you know, some of some of what you do brings back those memories. And, and it's a very familiar, comforting feeling with all that excitement that's going around. So, um, Jamie, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I see another question here. Someone said, who is the fishiest guide you've worked with? I don't know if I should read that aloud because I don't know if I've got an answer. <laughs> um, but I will say that uh, everyone that worked with me on these projects um, came through and that was a uh, huge relief. I think they were, they were vetted whether they knew it or not <laughs> through word of mouth and um, came through in spades. And, How often do people say no? How often do people say no? Um, mm -hmm. Not very often, but we don't, we've Good. maintained a decent um, respect for the guides and um, for the most part, they've, they, they, they crazy enough to join us, you know? <laughs> um, and Andy Smith's pretty fishy too. He's down there in the Bahamas. Hey, Jamie, you had a question here uh, about, um, from James Lynch about um, how we use these films and other shorts to better the protection and conservation of mm -hmm. this great species that we all love. I assume it's meaning the striped bass, but probably that extends to all of the game fish that we, we love. Just in terms of uh, conservation? 
Yeah, just how, how does your art form help in that regard? And how can yeah, you- I mean, what you hope to do um, is raise a level of enthusiasm. It's sort of like the old model of the zoo, which I thought was a little bit weird, but the idea is you're supposed to, if you expose people to this animal, then, and you tell them that, you know, Barbar is going to get killed or something in the wild or, you know, Simba. And so the idea, if you show it to them, they'll, they won't want to kill it. So if you show them a tarpon and you tell them that, you know, um, this is a fish worth, you know, treating in a manner that they don't die by, by shark or by exhaustion, or if you catch a striper and you show them, wow, that's, that's insane. This is, we should, but, but oh, but guess what? They're, they're going to, they're, they're, they're dying. So in, in every, in every one, we hope that we're showing something that people will be excited about enough that they'll watch it enthusiastically more than once if we've made it correctly and then sh- hopefully show their friends and then they'll think you know that shouldn't that sh- should not be removed from this planet you know and so we're we're just trying to raise the profile of these fish and then when it's extreme like in the case of the striper we're going to be much more um we're going to push it even more you know and i think that the um that was really integral to this project is, is every single scene in one way or another reinforced that idea yeah. as best we could. Yeah, and, and, and there was, as celebratory as Running the Coast was, there was a, there was, and I don't know if you meant this intentionally, but there was a melancholy that ran through it too. And, and particularly because it marked the end of an incredible run uh, of striped bass and until really until this last fall we didn't see the kind of blitz that you captured in that film. So I don't know whether you intended it or not, but it certainly captured some sense of wistfulness on the part of those of us who live, love the striper fishery. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a passion within the striped bass community. And I think that, um, you know, you're talking about a lot of times what you've got to go through to get that fish. And then when Paul Dixon said to me, you know, you may have fished the, you know, film the last blitz. Um, I said, oh my God, well, I hope not. But, you know, with, there was this idea that maybe we were literally just documenting something that people would have to just show on a screen rather than see in person. And um, I think it's hard to imagine that the striped bass could have gotten in that critical position because it's still better than it was right before the moratorium, but not a ton better. And so I think as long as people are still catching fish, they there's always this narrative that it's it's okay i can keep like man keep an extra you know maybe i can take one more home or maybe i don't have to fully revive it but when they talk about the numbers you're talking i don't know how many fish but you're talking maybe nine percent of the 40 odd million that are caught maybe don't even make it and so that's 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 a big number have you thought about making a film jamie about conservation that's three or four million died. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I would love to find a subject where we could just bring a subject to life. But in a way, the key is I feel like people are going to want to watch it. I think I want them to be entertained enough to want to watch it more than once and not get depressed. It's always that yeah, fine can't be, line. Can't be morose, right? Yeah, it's a, that fine line because you know we we have a we have a decent tolerance for bad news, but we don't want to lie to ourselves. We just we want to share it in, in the best way we can. And I think some people have zero tolerance for it and just say it doesn't exist. And that, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but for those of us that know it exists and want to share that, we have to find ways to, to bring people around. I think that's by celebrating it on their terms. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's a great way to end this evening. And um, I thank you both, Jamie and Eric, for the extra time here. I mean, what a great discussion. It's been super, super uh, meaningful to me. Uh, I, you know, just having watched the films long before I got to know you personally, Jamie, and then to hear that your passion and your, the stories behind everything that you've done um, makes it that much more meaningful. Uh, Dave, any, any last words you want to say? Yeah, Jamie, thank you so much. I mean, you know, watching your film and the discussion tonight and, you know, as, as you probably know, I'm out there every day. So, uh, anything you can do to, you know, bring awareness and, and, and a positivity to this great fishery um, is really appreciated. Um, uh, 
let me break from that for a second. And, and Eric, thank you so much again. Um, for all of those, uh, for those of you who are out there on both Facebook and, uh, and the Eventbrite uh, people, thank you very much for joining us. Um, let me just tell you uh, uh, quickly on our schedule, uh, uh, a week from, uh, actually six days from now will be me. Um, on uh, March 7th, we have Johnny King. On March 21st, we have Ken Yuklin, uh tying flies on 411. Tony Friedrich in our last um, uh, officially scheduled um, installment for the year on uh, May 2nd will be James Prosek. Um, everything can be found on mastersofthefly.com slash events, as you can see on the screen. And we really look forward to having everyone continue to join us week in, week out. Um, and we thank you. Let me add one and let's thing. not uh, not forget to drive drive a little bit of traffic to howardfilms.com so that people can yes. stream running the yeah, coast. Actually, uh, um, that's a good point, Eric. And Jamie, uh, I know that you were very generous in offering a bit of uh, a bonus for those who are still watching uh, in terms of being able to download your films for a discount. You want to mention that? Yeah. So for those who are still around, we figured you we'd you'd get a reward. So. Go to, if you go to howardfilms.com, um, the code, if you just proceed to buy Running the Coast, is just Masters of the Fly MOF1. That'll take 25% off right away. When you're buying it, you'll see a promo code option. It's not the VIP code, because there's that too. And then that'll, that'll take it right off. And so then you own it for life. It's not like uh, iTunes where you've got to download it. It'll just be, you can play it any time off a of stream. I'm, I'm awesome. doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> you Thank go. you, Jamie. And, and for anyone who has not seen these movies, don't hesitate. Download them now. They are must-watch, must-watch films. They will get you through the rest of the winter before the spring season. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank everybody. You, Jamie. It was a privilege. Yes, sir. Eric, thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thanks for, for watching. Me. It was Good fun. Good night, all. See ya. Good night, everyone.